Welcome to Full Exposure On Location, coming to you from Jump in Austin, Texas at the 2019 South by Southwest Film Festival. With a backdrop of art installations, barbecue, music, DJs, sticker graffiti, scooters, tacos, singing nuns, quirky promotions, and bizarre loopy street spectacle, we have some fabulous guests on tap. Conversations with directors and cinematographers of some of the most inventive, funny, moving, and important documentary and narrative indie films that screen here in Austin. Join us at South by Southwest. I'm your host, Jim Camp. On today's episode, we spoke with documentary cinematographer Amy Bench. We initially spoke with Amy about shooting Darisha Kai's doc short, Trans in America, Texas Strong, screened here in Austin. Amy directed her own film premiering at South by Southwest in the Texas Shorts competition. A Lion Birds Cannot See is an animated documentary about a 12-year-old setting out across the desert, escaping kidnappers on a search for her mother and a place where they can be safe. After our interview, Amy learned her film won the Texas Shorts Special Jury Award. But first, the trailer from A Line Birds Cannot See. Coming to the U.S. was very unexpectedly horrific. When I was 12 years old, the only thing I was thinking about was surviving. I didn't want to die. You have a film. Can you talk about how you, uh, what the title is and how you got motivated, what your motivation was to do this? So the title of the film is called A Lion Birds Cannot See, and it's a story of, it's an immigration story. I got started on it a couple of years ago. I was inspired when I was working on another shoot for Teen Vogue. They were doing a series on Syrian women. They wanted to dispel some of the myths about um, the religion, their beliefs, why they're here. And so we spent a couple of days interviewing women who lived in Austin that came here within the last year or two from Syria. And I was, they were just such powerful people and I wanted to dig deeper into the immigration experience. And so I went on my own journey searching for somebody to tell the story of how and why they came to this country because I feel like it's something that's often overlooked and that especially the trauma of coming to this country that it's not something anybody would, would wish upon themselves um, it's all about surviving and so I wanted it to, to tell a, a story of survival and so that's how I, I made the film. The way I started doing this project, I did it interview, I was interviews, and I didn't bring a camera with me. I was a one-man band because I felt like I would be able to establish a trust relationship even quicker that way. And I would be able to work around my own production schedule. Not have, I, could, I could be available at the last minute. I wouldn't need to do a lot of coordinating with other people and it was cheaper that way. So, and I, a lot of people I interviewed didn't speak English and so I was hiring translators and I didn't want it to be all about the production, I wanted it to be about their story. And so my casting process was basically doing these interviews with people. And when the woman that I filmed for this or recorded for this, Adilsa told me her story, I knew there was something to it that was really powerful. And the more we talked, the more I realized that, that the most powerful part of her story was her journey to this country. I didn't know if I was going to be doing something more in the present day of what it's like to live in the U.S. as an immigrant or what it was like beforehand. But with Adilsa, it was clearly the journey and being separated from her mom and kidnapped yeah. and somehow making it finally across the border after six months of living in the desert and, and being yeah. a victim of human trafficking, that that was her story. and. I talked with one of my producers and she really encouraged me to think about animation. And so I went that route and as a visual storyteller, I'm, I'm used to using cameras and working with people in real time where you're filming interviews and, and lighting and all of that. But this, this allowed me to go back to her many times and dig deeper and not have to worry that we were in the same location. and. 
<clears throat> locations was another reason that animation worked well because where I was able to interview her wasn't necessarily somewhere that you'd want to show on camera cinematically. Um, it was too small of a space to even bring in lights. Um, so I was able to focus more on her story and and after the screenings, people have told me animation really worked for this because to hear such a horrific story, yet have it be animated, it kind of allowed you to not have to turn away. Mm. Sometimes seeing something so directly can be really difficult. Mm. And the animation lets your mind kind of imagine what must have been going on without having to look at it directly. And let the words. And let the words yeah. soak in. So. I think being a cinematographer helps because telling a story through animation is still, the visuals are equally, if not even more important than in a live action piece. So I definitely used the skill set that I have as a DP to work with the animator to, to storyboard the film and come up with a visual style. Mm. And, um, who, the, the animator is Steve animator. West. Um, he's out you, of London. How did you connect? My my producer Carolyn Merriman has worked with. Um, Wait, Steve. Steve West. Steve West. Okay, because so I'm thinking of another. I'm thinking of yeah. Steve Cuts. He's, he's called English anime. Yeah, yeah, he calls him. He goes by the name Lazy Chief. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Lazy Chief and I had a long distance relationship. Yeah. <laughs> no, we worked remotely. Um, we basically storyboarded and scripted, and hmm. the whole film took about a year to make, from from What's inception. The What's the runtime? It's nine and a half minutes. Yeah. And you and you showed uh, here at. I showed it South here by. at South by. Yeah, I have one more screening left. So How'd it go? It was great. It was great. Um, people. One woman came up to me and said, "I think everybody in America needs to see this movie," and I think. What it does is it, you know, you hear the voice of it. She's 26, year old, 26 years old now, but you hear the voice of this young woman talking about all the, all the horrific things that happened to her. But now she's a successful business person, a DACA recipient, so she's working here legally. Yet her life is very uncertain. The DACA program has been under scrutiny, and the, the White House is trying to bring it to an end. So she doesn't know, she can't plan more than a year at, at a time, basically. So I think films like these are important to show that people coming to this country are really, they, they've been put in these dire situations and they've transcended them and oftentimes they can prevail and they are, they are doing great things for our country. And and it's a story that you don't often hear. It's it's more about the rhetoric of, of securing borders and and knowing who each immigrant is and where they came from. And this is it's, it's just important to see that so many of these people, the situations that they're coming from, they can't sustain. They can't live there. It's either it's either come to our country or die. And that's it's a hard decision to put on anybody. I mean. Every, I think anybody in this country would choose to live at, at whatever cost, um, even if it meant putting your life at risk and going through the desert for five days without food and water. It's, it's the reality, and I don't think people understand that that's actually what happens. It really does happen. <laughs> um, children get sold into slavery and sex trafficking and human trafficking, and, it, and that's what happens to them when you dump them on the other side of the border. And, I think it's important for people to hear that and think about that when they when they're figuring out how to reform immigration policies. Well, there's so much uh, <coughs> disinformation about, yeah, and there's so little uh, platform for voices of these people. Yeah. So this sounds like it's a really cool way to give these people a voice. Yeah, and this is the first film I've done about this topic, but I. I'm interested in doing a series so that you can hear voices from around the world um, talking about their immigration experience. I was gonna say, are there more planned? You... I'm hoping to do it. I just finished the film uh, a month ago. In your less. mind, maybe <laughs> more planned. And so I do have more planned. It's I need to cast the the rest of the series, but yeah, it's 
I really wanted to have a female perspective on her immigration experience, and, and I think it's really Im important to have more of those first-person narratives out there. So that's mm. why I made the film. Mm. Well, it sounds great. I yeah. wish you the best of luck with it. Thank Good you. luck with your showing here. Yeah. And um, we'll, uh, we'll put up a, a URL for it. And okay. um, can anybody see it online, or uh, will that a, be coming? There's a trailer, mm -hmm. and I'm in the process of getting a distributor, so it might be available online or, or through educational channels, but I'll be doing screenings across okay. the and country. And of course, we'll show the trailer. We've shown, we've shown the yeah. trailer, too, so. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks so, for telling us yeah. about it. It's really Thank great. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck with it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for coming. That's all for now on Full Exposure from South by Southwest. In Austin, MJ Johnson was our director of photography. Dan Walnicki audio engineered and edited Huda Khalid, associate produced. A very special thanks to Laurie Welts at Film Fatales for introducing us to the filmmakers who appeared on the show.